Okay, so first of all, my apologies for speaking as well. But I do hope that uh, this talk uh, helps probably tie a little bit together various ideas. Um, it's certainly still at the beginning, that's not a complete story. And it's, uh, I'll tell it at a rather simple minded level, so the mathematics will be rather basic, physics as well, so everything is a little bit naive, but you can make it. Okay? And I should mention that this is work with my PhD student, Leonard Smith, who is there. And uh, he'll also give a long short talk about detailed aspects of this. Um, yeah, the research topic is a little bit controversial. Don't blame him for that. That's all I know. But he did excellent work on this. Uh, okay, so the motivation. Um, I probably don't have to uh, discuss this slide in great detail because we've seen all these talks already yesterday in the morning. It's actually D-brains are dragged by strings. The fact of description is essentially a theory of the endpoints because we have chance for these and we get gauge theory. Uh, so Studying string theory by gauge theory is a long success story. Many, many results have been obtained in this way. And now you want to lift all this up to M theory and see what happens there. Well, we in M theory we have M2 brains and then five brains, and they interact by these uh, well, the five brains interact by M2 brains. And the boundary is now no longer a point, but it's a one dimensional object. And the string is self closed string, and the effective description there should, should be a theory of self closed strings, and the parallel transport of these of course, a high gauge theory because now you're power transporting extended objects. And so a naive conjecture is then the long sought to zero theory, and the broad volume theory, well, the target space theory of, of these six and five frames, that should be a high gauge theory. Okay, so that's, that's roughly the idea at a very naive level. And now let's just see, go with it and see how far we can push that. Um, Okay, outline. The two zero theory, just quickly summarizing, we've already heard a lot of it, what we know and what we want. Present your wish list that I want to fulfill that I can't fulfill at the moment. High gauge theory, lightning review, just very, very basics because I don't think we have seen yet how to construct explicitly a high gauge theory. Uh, guidance from BTS are two strings, so they, they will tell us something about the gauge structure that we should use as the natural gauge structure. But then I'll discuss uh, six dimensions of super power field theory, and then I come to the open problems um, and go through them in detail what we don't know yet. So what we know about what we want. So this is essentially the, uh, the string theory result summary at a very coarse level. So it's a six dimension superconformal field theory that we are after. So it appears in type B on K3 compactifications as we heard. Also it appears in the description of parallel and five frames. Um, it's a theory of self with strings, the boundary of N2 between N5 as I said before. And they become masters if the N5 frames approach each other just as you know from D brains with the D brains come together into a stack uh, separated and with zero separation and they become uh, massless and you get increased to the non-abelian theory. Right, and so this is exactly what we want to do here. We want to have a non-abelian analog for five brains. We want to have a description of stacks of parallel and five brains. The field content of the two zero uh, theory is the two zero tensor multiple. This has been known for a long time. All these supersymmetry representations have been classified and well, the sixth dimension there was more curiosity for a long time when none found this, and many people believe why well, we can't construct quantum field theories in more than uh, superconform quantum field theories in more than five, four dimensions, but uh, then Whitman came up with this construction, and now it's believed that this theory, of course, exists. So the field content, therefore, would be a self good three form field strength. So we have a two form potential sourcing a three form field strength that's self dual. We get five codes from scalars, so what they do is we have the the M5 brain, which is from space-time perspective, a six-dimensional object in flat space-time, and the transverse fluctuations, of course, characterized by the scalars, and we have fermionic partners, right? So that's the key point, and that's kind of clear. Um, the observables are, many people argue that they are Wilson surfaces, so not Wilson, but Wilson surfaces, and therefore there should be indeed some kind of notion of power transport of strings in hand. The common belief is that that's not a grand description, as we have heard many times, and uh, this theory is really important because it's really the analog of the n equals 4 super ml theory, you know, that has been called the harmonic oscillator of the 21st century. So having this theory, getting a good handle on this theory is really very important. And there are lots of people working on this. Uh, in the string theory community, there's also mathematical reasons that's referred. And yeah, there's, there's a, quite a bit of motivation for finding out what it really is. Okay, so what would we expect from a successful M5 band model? And this is really a wish list. This is what the ultimate goal would be. I'm not saying that yet getting uh, close to fulfilling all of this. So first of all, we need a uh, interacting self to two form gauge potential, right? A gauge potential that sources a self to three form and should be interacting, of course, otherwise things are boring. We 
we should base everything on sound mathematical foundations, trying to do that from the beginning so that we can put our theory in arbitrary manifolds and then we should stay that there are no contradictions and so on. And therefore, from the outset, we just choose high bundles. That's, that's our answer to this problem. Uh, we want the field content of the two zero theory. As we heard in Neil's talk, we don't really expect the full supersymmetry to be manifest today in the theory, so we probably expect only n equals one supersymmetry. And uh, the H structure should be natural, it should match some expectations. Ideally, we would want the restriction to ADE, I can't do that yet, but we should get at least for the ADE series, we should get some H structures. Um, we want non trivial coupling, interactive field theory, of course. We want to have a restriction to the free n equals 2 tensor multiplier. Ideally, we would like to have a non abelian set of string soliton as a DPS state in there and a nice candidate for that. Or we'll construct first and then see that this is indeed the case. And then the key test is a reduction to superior mills theories. Uh, ideally, you would want a reduction to five dimensional. I have no idea how this works, but we can do a reduction to four dimensional superior mills in some way that's kind of similar to the M2 brain uh, um, uh, reduction. And, um, well, there is kind of a remnant, there should be some remnant of T-duality in, in M theory as well. So you would want also somehow a reduction from this M5 brain theory to the transcise matter theories that describe M2 brains, right? And then in particular, it's important that we recover some of the discrete copies also. And then the, the hardest part, of course, is to uh, expect uh, to match the modular space of the true zero theory, and this is certainly something that we can't do. Can I object? Yeah, sure. What else? Well, I don't want to object, but. Uh, <laughs> you can add to the list. Actually, I'm sorry. Can I add? Yeah, yeah, of course. I object to the first one. Okay. Because it, it, this is a, a self dual theory of electric and magnetic charges. Now, in, in an electric theory, we introduce a gauge potential. Because yeah. there are no magnetic charges. Yeah. But if you have both electric and magnetic charges, you do, why do you think you're going to have a gauge potential? No, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I should have said not that for the two-form. Uh, the two-form gauge potential, right? So, so you say you don't believe that there's B-field. Yeah, because there's both okay. electric and magnetic charges. Right, right, right. Okay, so, so this is, it's a wish list, right? It's not, <laughs> not really said it's going on. Um, this I know what I said is heresy, but I think... No, 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 it might be, yeah, yeah, of course, I mean, anything goes at the moment, but has the theory, right? So. Can I object to Neil also? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can form a local model where I have a two-form B field, which is what he wants to have, and then still have topologically non-trivial things like a magnetic charge. I mean, yeah, I do that all the time. I have a Dirac monopole, and I still allow myself to have a vector field. And we I mean, locally describe degrees of freedom with that. So but, but that satisfies that df equals d star f equals zero, almost everywhere. Yeah. But if you had some equations of motions... So, uh, maybe I didn't understand the objection, the first objection. <laughs> so, well, I, I, mean, I think we sort of know what Well, if you have an interactive theory, you will have equations like d star h equals dh equals sources. Yeah, sure. And those sources will not be delta function points. Yeah. No, not so. so why would you expect there to be a B such that ah, okay. yeah. well, At the moment it works for the B field. So <laughs> let's, let's see how far we get, right? Let, let's see how far we get. Uh, that, that's my wishes. That's, that's what I would like to have. And to a certain extent I get it. <laughs> okay, so uh, not a really time transport as in what? The arguments that you usually hear against the classic to zero theory and he has already summarized them. Uh, first, you usually hear the non abelian power transport of strings is problematic. I mean, non abelian jerks exist, so this argument is not really relevant anymore. What is relevant, though, is to find relevant an interesting example of truly non abelian jerks. I mean, abelian jerks by now everybody accepts them, all of them, that they are there. But we, we really would like to have examples of non abelian jerks that are physically reasonable, that are not, not artificial, so really non trivial examples there. Um, then the old string theory argument is that there's no continuous coupling constant. This is because it's a um, conformal field theory, so we have no dimensional, dimension full parameter. Um, but we can also not have dimension less parameters because you can show that this theory exists in isolated singularities. So there's no continuous coupling constant. You also can actually show this by trying to deform the abelian theory in the BD formalism. We try to form away from the abelian point something non abelian that doesn't work either. It's a proof. So uh, if you don't have continuous coupling constant well, then you probably don't have a classical Lagrangian. But the same actually happens for the M2 brains, and as soon as you allow for discrete coupling constants, everything's fine. So we expect a discrete coupling constant, and indeed we have uh, reasons for uh, that our theory has a discrete coupling constant. Does point one mean that you're going to violate the phase lattice? Sorry? Does point one here mean you're going to violate the phase lattice? No, I don't know. Just ask. Okay. No, no, no. 
Okay, and then the, the argument uh, by Whitman, uh, Neil summarized that the reduction of 5D young girls seems impossible. We seem to be able to reduce to 40 young girls. You, can, you might like this reduction, you might not. It's 40 young girls is in a certain limit. You can certainly like expectation values for fears that's in there, even with data terms. And then the action for self growth three forms is problematic anyway, but uh, the PSP formulas can be used. And then you can ask, okay, how useful is this actually really? Can you quantize that? Can you do anything with it? Let's just postpone these questions and let's just see how far we get in the first place. Okay, high gauge theory, lightning review. Uh, guideline will be category theory, and simply because of this quote by John Bias, we try to extend gauge theory, we try to define something new that hasn't been there before, rather than if you want to define something in consistent ways with that guideline. And category theory is a subject where you can leave definitions as exercises, so we just do these exercises, and hopefully we arrive at something. <coughs> Okay, so um, first thing that we need to get under control is the gauge structure. So we need some generalization of uh, Lie algebra. And as we discussed already quite a few times, so let me just quickly go through this. We use the language of NQ manifold just because it's very convenient. That's the quickest way I know to define these kind of infinity or higher Lie algebra. Um, you can think of it as a graded manifold. You have just an ordinary manifold and then a graded vector bundle over it. So the linear space is over it. In smooth category, you can always restrict to the special case. And uh, on top of this uh, graded vector bundle of an ordinary manifold, your vector field Q of degree 1 and it squares <coughs> 0. Right? So this essentially already defines for you everything that you need for an infinity algebra. And so this can think both numbers. This is also why we use the letter Q, also BRSP chart, and it's from, an, from string field theory. So this is actually no, this already used that in many cases. Uh, important will be that the functions on this NQ manifold, they form a differential graded algebra. And we have seen this already many, many times in various forms. Important examples that I'll use is a tangent algebra. So we take the tangent bundle of our manifold, trade shift the fibers by one. And then if you look at the functions of this, because the functions is of course the same as uh, the, the differential forms on the manifold, and Q can be identified uh, with an undifferential with the canonical Q structure that we have on there. So the tangent algebra allows us to capture differential forms on our manifold. On the other hand, if you imagine that the manifold is just a point, you get to the interesting case of an infinity algebra, so I algebra. And in particular, if you say, okay, let, let's assume that my vector bundle only has something non trivial in degree 1 or minus 1, depending on how you interpret this shift, right? You don't only have something non trivial in here, a vector space for the point as a bundle, right? Then you can introduce coordinates to alpha of degree 1 on there. And then the most general uh, vector fields of this form. And the Jacobi identity is then equivalent to this condition Q squared equals zero. Right? So this is a very compact way of uh, encoding Lie algebras. And the true algebras, so first step in categorification, you can then essentially encode in uh, allowing for two components of your graded vector bundle, degree one, degree two, the three algebra three components, and so on. Your vector field will then have more components, more structure constants that define higher brackets, and the homotopy Jacobi identity that you've seen in other talks just amounts to Q squared equals zero. And this is a very, very easy, convenient way that's sort of not accessible to encode this kind of algebra. Okay, so that gives us the gauge structure, at least uh, abstractly. <coughs> and okay, so how do we do now gauge theory with these? Right. So we have the gauge structure. Now we want a canonical way of identifying the kinematical data of gauge theory. So we want to know what are the gauge potentials. What are the curvatures? Uh, what are the Bianchi identities? And what are the H transformations? Right? Just the kinematical data of this. And the idea goes back to Carton and uh, Strobel and collaborators have worked on this. But the full uh, picture is really due to Satishai and Sasha. And um, well, what you want to do is the following. You, you have in the local description of H theory, you have differential forms and you have Lie algebras. And you want to kind of bring this together in unifying language because we don't compare apples to pears. But we go up to the category of fruits, and then we have five, right? <laughs> so um, yeah. we do essentially the same here, right? So we uh, differential forms and Lie algebras, we bring them together by regarding them both as differential graded algebras, right? And uh, the differential graded algebra that we use for differential forms is just a familiar one, just a Lagrange complex. That's already the language that we want to use. And for Lie algebras, we have to extend it slightly. You've uh, been hearing in Dominicans talk a lot about the Chevalier Einberg algebra. That's not quite sufficient. That gives you flat connections. What you want to you want to extend this a little bit. You take essentially the graded tangent bundle of the Lie algebra, the functions on top of that, that also carries the natural Q. Right? And this gives you what's called the Bay algebra, the Bay. And um, so you get this 
essentially two copies. Uh, this is a differential, the, the, the algebra of functions on these two copies uh, gives you a differential equation algebra together with Q. And now everything becomes very natural because the kinematical data is completely encoded in a morphism of differential equation algebra from this way algebra to the way algebra of the manifold, which is uh, uh, the omega bullet, uh, the, the lambda complex of the manifold. I should say that this feature is a little bit naive. There are a few more details to it. But essentially, given a way algebra, you can construct this data in a straightforward manner, right? So this is a really straightforward, explicit way of defining what a high gauge theory is, and there's no mystical magic involved or anything. You can write down everything. So so what does it mean? We have, on our first copy, we have coordinates to psi alpha. We, they are of degree 1, so we should map this to something of degree 1, so we get a 1. It's of course a potential. We have a shifted uh, coordinate, right, from our second copy. And this should be mapped to something of degree 2, not surprisingly, that's the curvature. But now this map should respect the Q-structure, and that essentially means that this curvature is not anything, but it's actually given in terms of potentials in this form. But then also, the, this map should respect the Q-structure, and then you get the Bianchi yeah, identity. Yeah. The gauge transformations, as explained many times by, by Wilson and other people, are given by homotopies between these EGA morphisms, and the topological invariants are captured by invariant polynomials on um, uh, this way algebra. Right? So, given any way algebra here, this formula doesn't tell you what is the high gauge theory, or what is the corresponding gauge theory on a manifold. And moreover, here you can imagine that you generalize it by something else. You can do non-commutative spaces and just look at the algebra of forms on non-commutative spaces. Look at the DGA morphism. Well, it's not no longer commutative, as we always assume, but non-commutative algebra. But then you also get so. So this is a very, very general way of defining gauge theory for outer way algebra that represents your gauge structure, outer way algebra that respects, uh, represents your differential forms. You can also extend this from L infinity algebra to algebraics, and you get sigma models, gauge sigma models, and so on. So this is a very, very general feature that you can have to define a uh, gauge theory. Right? So general notion of gauge theory, just from pair, pairs of differential graded algebra. So it tells you everything you want to know. Okay? So we can use this framework then later on to do plug in uh, L infinity algebra. Okay. So big question is now, which high energy algebra should we take, right? So we extended ordinary algebra <coughs> by having components in degree 1, degree 2, in our NQ picture. So there's a lot of freedom, right? And now you have to choose one to make sense, because if you just try and play with this, you quickly realize that you don't get anything interesting. Um, and the guidance here that we use is essentially BPS self-closed strings. They are the BPS states of our 2 zero theory. And they should tell us um, how things work, right? So just to remind you, you should see them as m theory lists of monopoles. So the usual d brain interpretation of a monopole is, for example, that. Like you have a G1 brain ending on the B3 brain. Here's a brain picture. Um, and from the perspective of the B3 brain, you just describe this by the monopole, monopole equation. Continualize this situation from type 2B to type 2A, and then lift it up to m theory. And you get this picture, also BPS configuration. And then from the perspective of M5 brain, you expect that you get this abelian sexual string. Right? Uh, right, just the abelian case because the non-abelian case is kind of more. Well, we, we have a proposal, but it's still a little bit of a discussion, I would say. So uh, that's the picture. So we can learn a lot about what gauge structure we should choose here, like give interesting examples just from comparing two models. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so what happens really in the transition from an abelian monopole to non-abelian monopole? Um, well, the Dirac monopole is really principally one bundle over R3 with a, with a position of the monopole excluded because then we don't have a potential, or S2 if you want, charge one monopole, just a single one, and then we just get the Hopf vibration. Right? Now, the Kof polyakov monopole is probably the most interesting example to try to mimic. The principal S2 bundle, the trivial one, of course, over R3. So, what happened in this transition? Well, on the one hand side, you want to preserve the topological flavor of the Dirac monopole. On the other hand, you want to trivialize everything. So how can you do that? Well, you can do that if you take a bundle morphism from here into here by providing a morphism of, of V groups U1 to SU2, at least asymptotically. And that means that you take the total space of the principal bundle that describes the Dirac monopole as a gauge group for the non abelian case that you can then trivialize, right? So, so that's roughly the observation. I mean, you might like this, you might not like this. This is what, uh, what I saw in this uh, just, uh, heuristic. So I see uh, going from the abelian to the non abelian case, you take the total space of the, the bundle that describes the abelian case, and you use that, you promote it to the gauge group of the non abelian case. Okay? So let's try and see if we can actually lift this up to M theory. So in the abelian case, the Z string 
is something in R4, it lives in R4, um, simply because of the way that you, can I go back? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't care about the temporal direction, you don't care about the direction that the M2 and the M5 have in common, so there are just four directions left over, so something in R4, and um, if I place it somewhere in R4, then there's a similarity there, just as for the monopole, and then I have a fundamental feeling jerk over S3. Right? S3, um, just take the volume form as the characteristic class for my jerk. So there's a one jerk which has determined value class, which is the high analog of the churn class one, just as the monopole with a um, single monopole have here churn class one bundle. Right? There's precisely an analog of that. And in the non abelian case, I want principal two bundle over R4. So the analogy is now use the total two space of this jerk as a gauge two group. Right. So a jerk, I mean, might, might sound a little bit scary, but at the end of the day, it's a central groupoid extension, and groupoid is a categorified space. So there's certainly a categorified space underlying, categorified manifold underlying it. And now the question is just, can I just endow it with a two-group structure? And the answer is yes, and it's not just any two-group, but it's a very nice one. It's a string two-group one, so it's a model, two-group model of the string group, and uh, there are various, various reasons for using that. Okay, so this analogy tells us actually what gauge group to use, and also it tells us what the analog of SU2 is, in a certain sense it's the analog of a string group, uh, a string 3, which is a string group for spin 3. Okay, oh, there we go. Okay, string 2 group and M-theory, there are many, many reasons from many perspectives when you look at it, everything suggests that you should actually work with a string 2 group, so let's just go with it for the moment. If you want more reasons, you can, can, can look into our paper, or in particular in paper, and uh, then the total space of this fundamental job over S3 is really the analog of spin 3 categorified analog from any perspective. You can actually brutally take this model, there's a very scary model uh, by Schommer Fries, and you can differentiate it just like uh, Paul Chevera explained, and then the result is a stringy 2 algebra that you saw in many talks of course. And you can, can man actually do this explicitly, so this is not just a hand waving computation, but you really differentiate it, and the result is indeed this stringy 2 algebra. Okay, so this is the D2 algebra that we'll work with. It just has spin 3 or SU2 in degree 0, and it just has an additional component of R in degree 1. And these are the brackets, the usual D bracket here, and the Carter Killing form gives you a 3 bracket. And important for us, just as a test, as a test of our consistency of all our equations and theories, is that there's a quasi isomorphic model that was discovered, well, discovered by, by, by Kranz, uh, Schreiber, and such. Uh, no, no, it's uh, I think, I'm sorry. And this is quasi isomorphic. So, what we expect is that whenever we can write down equations of motion for this stringy 2 algebra, this model of the stringy 2 algebra, we should also be able to find analogous equations for these, and the gauge orders should kind of match into each other. Because physics should be, of course, agnostic about the, uh, this quasi isomorphism, right? So, this is an important consistency check, and we'll come back to this. And, of course, as you observe for any AED algebra, it can define the corresponding. Uh, the true algebra, yeah. actually for any metric in the algebra, you can do that. Okay, so uh, let's go about <coughs> constructing our high gauge theory for this f string. So the key map data, in principle, we get it readily from this DGA morphism. You take the string 3 that I just presented to you, you construct the Bay algebra in a straightforward manner, and you just consider these morphisms. If you do this, and this is actually the point I think where many, think, where many people failed to continue and where many people gave up uh, um, uh, trying and actually this is also something that we struggled for years and years about uh, because we did the words and uh, Domenico's and uh, Pichon's papers. Um, if you do this then you get these fake curvatures, they're quite notorious by now and they need to vanish for consistent parallel transport. You get many issues that your curvatures are actually not transferring covariantly under gauge transformations and you can't really write down gauge invariant equations of motion. So that's not a good uh, the solution is that you need to modify your way out, but I use here the term twist, that's probably not the best term, but the details are uh, in this paper, so you need to modify your way out in such a way that you actually trivialize the uh, first point the class of the underlying uh, gauge structure. And then, what you do to them, that you just do your usual thing, the DGA morphism from this modified way algebra into the differential form, and then you get what's called a string structure. You get the you get the potentials and the curvatures and the Bianchi identity for these, right? So what you have, you have a one form potential on R4 with values in the algebra. I mean, I said we use string three, so we can just use SU2. 
true here. We have a true form, that's just value in one. You get the curvature that you expect here, you get curvature here. And this additional term, which complements the AQ term to a term Simon term, this is actually the new term that arises from uh, modifying this value algebra. So this is kind of the key ingredient that cost us so many years to really understand what's going on. And uh, then the Bianchi identity is just the usual one here, and here you see a very, very nice equation that you know from the uh, anomaly cancellation. Then you add it by hand the X field, and that should be. Maybe, maybe just, uh, yeah. this, this is the answer to, I think, to Neil, or maybe the answer to Neil's comment, that is, we have a gauge potential B, but due to the non abelian high gauge field structure, it's A is not just equal to DB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think to me that might have been your question, sir. So H is not yeah. actually closed yeah. as a source, even though you have a gauge potential. Yeah, comes from the higher. Exactly. And this media is an interaction that you'll see. Okay. And then, of course, we add by hand a uh, Higgs field. But right? it should, because it's the same supermodel as B and comes from dimension reduction of B in certain sense from six dimension, we also give it as just a one. So just a function on our forward values in one. Okay. So this is, this was essentially in this paper. And then you try to it out with the dynamical principle. The obvious thing, the obvious choice is, of course, that we want H equals such D phi for self to string. And this implies that the Bianchi identity is of this form. So you see that really only cares about the second uh, turn class here. And this motivates that you in additionally endow it with the equation as the self rule on the self rule, right? If you want really the full picture, the, well, what you really should be doing there is you should enlarge the gauge algebra a little bit to SC2 plus SC2. And then you get instantons in one sector, anti-instantons in the other, because one of the conditions for having it consistent for, for being able to, to, to solve this equation at all is that C2 of F should be zero, right? So, so then you can combine instanton, anti-instanton. As long as you have the same number, you still have this condition, and you really are guaranteed that you have a solution for this, right? So this is a dynamic principle. You can write down solutions, and it's all of it. It's also interesting because this is essentially what you saw, saw yesterday in the talk by Sir Kim on the one zero theory. So this is quite nice that we matched that. Of course, I should admit that we didn't know that the one zero people were discussing this equation order in spite of a bit of detail. Excuse me, yeah. can you explain that for the one way the second chance is about zero? Well, you wanted to, to solve this, right? So if I write an integral here, then uh, over, for example, over compact manifold of S4, then D gives me the boundary, and then the integral of this has to vanish. So that is consistent. And what if you have the boundary? Well, the boundary, of course, you can. So, so that let's assume that, well, ultimately, I want to discuss instantons, so I assume that all the fees are falling off, so essentially I'm on S4. Um, with the boundary, you can have more. Sure. Can I, so what role is B playing? Because why can't you just always set it to zero? Yeah, in this case, we can essentially set it to zero, yeah. Cool. Um, you can, it essentially covers additional singularities that you have. So, so you can have, have additional abelian sample strings. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so, but we've seen this already yesterday, so what's so great about this? Um, well, we didn't know that, but um, first of all, I hope that I made a little bit of the point that the analog of SU2 in the first non abelian group that we look at in physics is really string three, so this is really what we should be studying to in search of examples. Um, then, furthermore, the string structures, they allow now for gauge invariant field equations, so that, that was one of the big. Um, Observations. So we should really be looking for string structures and not just for this naive old style of high gauge theory. Uh, we got examples of truly non abelian and interesting high bundles if you put them on, on common spaces. And uh, we can really do them together, right? So it's not just that we constructed these equations by hand, but I can precisely tell you how these bundles should be put together on topologically non trivial spaces, right? We can write down explicit code cycles such that this is really put together mathematically in a consistent way. So we have here an analog of the of principal um, SU2 bundles for, for, for monopoles, essentially, or not trivial manifolds. And the, and yeah? So can you just ask, you emphasize that SU2 is this uh, string three. Yeah. In the previous slide, you had G. Could, could G be anything in the previous slide? Essentially, yes, anything that's the metric here. Yeah. Yeah, you have a great one. Yeah, right. yeah, so I'm, I'm just intrigued about that. Yeah. In Neil's talk, he, he pointed out that the gauge group would often get fixed, and here you just seem to... Yeah, but this is a classical picture. I mean, yeah. from what I'm seeing is much more, I don't know. The VGS sector is quite hard, so there's not, nothing interesting. Okay. And the other point that I want to stress, um, so what we really spend a lot of time working out is that this quasi-isomorphism actually works. So we have also these twisted string structure. This is uh, this is for the 
for one of the Trinkle models, for the for the one involving the, the path space and the central extension of the loop space, you have a similar twisted um, string structure, and then you want to make sure that all the gauge uh, orbits are mapped into each other, gauge transformations are mapped into each other, so that you get mathematical consistency. And that's indeed the case. So this is really a classic quasi isomorphism. You give me any model of the stringy tour algebra, I put it in, and I tell you what the example string equations are in this particular model. So that works out very nicely. So this is kind of a consistency check uh, that, that we are looking at. Because the, kinematical, the dynamical principle we just put in by hand, right? so we need to verify that everything's the okay. same. Right, so let's make sure that we have time. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me probably sit here. So six dimensions of conform fifth year. Now we have the BGS sector, and now you wonder, okay, what can we do in terms of actions? Um, then you have to do some hard to see computations. I'm not very good at them, and I don't like them, so I try to avoid them. <laughs> so you just look in the literature, and then you find this very, very nice paper. It's incredible how far people get. Uh, well, you just already guess the, the right answer, the right guy, by tensor hierarchies, by, by Henning, uh, Seskin, and Robert Wimmer. Um, they have a six dimensional one zero model there, but I think it's fair to say there are a few issues with this model. So the choice of gauge structure was a little bit unclear, there are cubic interactions, scalar <coughs> fields with the wrong kinetic term, uh, self-real idea had to be imposed by hand. That was fixed, I should say, later on. They had a paper on uh, the PST mechanism for the sonic part. And it's unclear how to fulfill the complete wish list, right? What we previously already observed is that there's an underlying E3 algebra with extra structure. So we knew already that there's probably some relation by gauge theory, so why not try to put everything together? This essentially works. The only thing that you have to do is you have to notice that string G doesn't come with an inner product. There's an analogous notion of an inner product for an L-infinity algebra. You obtain this from a symplectic form on the NQ manifold that describes the L-infinity algebra. And uh, therefore you need to extend the string algebra. Here it's already written down in a form that arises from these twisted string structures uh, to a symplectic gradient vector space. So what you do is you take this Lee 3 algebra and you essentially double it. In this form, okay, and then you have a symplectic form on this piece. Then you remember that you, what you actually want in this twisted string structure is something that's still originally equivalent to G. So you need to extend this one further to a leak four algebra, but you still have an inner product on this structure. There's this a little bit of an intricate story. There is an extension of this to natural inner product, and if you do this, then you have exactly the right information to plug it into this one zero model. Right? So this is a special case of H structure for this one zero model. Everything works out. You have the field content of the tensor multiplet, one zero tensor multiplet. Um, then you also get a one zero vector multiplet. And you again, uh, you additionally get this standard magnitude C field, uh, which takes values in this additional part. And the action schematically looks like this. So here you see that we still have the problem with a, um, with a, a scalar field, so the kinetic term. But the cubic interaction term is gone. And well, you can write down everything. Right, so there is a one zero action that still has some problems, but uh, the so so What is the problem with Well, you get a, it's a wrong sign. Uh, well, ah. this, this has an uh, indefinite signature, right? Ah, so you okay. get those and so on. So if you want to find that on unitary and so on. Um, and the choice of gauge structure is a little bit clearer, right? At least we have one example, I would say. The string three is a good example to plug in. Could you just repeat the same? You're saying that action is such a the canonical action we get from this simplify. Yeah, yeah, precisely. You simplify your, your, you know, your standards. And, and the economic action is that, and that's the one that... That they have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, no, no, you, you can plug this structure into this. So, uh, in this one zero one, there are lots of structure constants. Uh, so, you identify the structure constants, uh, that this gives you a special example of that, and then you get this action. Okay. So, we didn't do any calculation, we just saw this model fits what we need, and uh, this works out nicely. Okay. So, then you can extend it with a PST type action. Uh, this has been done for the bosonic part, I should say, then the full PSP action was announced but, announced, but it didn't appear. So with the string structures, we then just constructed the full supersymmetric PSP case and let it put a lot of work into that, that worked nicely out. And then you can also add the matter field, so just that you get the full field content of the two zero theory, right? At least the field content should be the same when I just start with. So what do you get? The one zero theory in six dimensions satisfying many of the wishlist items. So I think all the first are satisfied. And now we come to the important ones. There is now a reduction to four dimensional superlinguist theory. And I should, well, what you need to do is it's not too hard, right? We started with something that had superlinguist in it anyway, uh, because it's conformed, it comes with this phi s. If you 
give this phi s a vacuum expectation value, as if you see this term, if you give the b as a vacuum expectation value, you just get n equals four sibling wells with a gauge group and theta term, right? To what extent this giving vacuum expectation value is something sensible to do, let's not discuss that here, but instead go to the next slide. So you can also do, yeah? So you're restricting the scalar to be positive? Uh, right. I mean, this mindset is probably just a convention here. Oh, before we do that, I mean, supposing that you had to integrate with the actual given. Yeah. But, uh, I would have a problem anyway with this uh, indefinite Kinetic term, right? so, so that's not the final action. I show you some some point. So I just want to show you what it can do. So it, it, you can embed, you have embedded any equals force to being wells in a strong coupling limit, just as you do in a true e two. Here the giving vacuum expectation value is of course much better uh, uh, argument than in our model. Where's the scalar potential? There's no scalar potential. But it's zero in this case. The Young Mills has one. Ah, oh, the Young Mills is these are the auxiliary field here, the oh, YY you can break them out. Uh, then you can also reduce that to M2 brain models um, and the way, uh, well, you have a trans science theory, you want to get a trans science theory, so what you do is you compactify on S3 cross R12, put here a jerk on S3, have B trivial on R12, you integrate the jerk, you get an integer coefficient, you get trans science theory with uh, integer coupling process, so that works as well. Uh, you can argue whether these are the right things to do, but at least it works on a naive level. Okay, so now important to get to the old problems in the last um, minute. So the first and the most important uh, issue with this model, and this is encouraging because it allows us, it tells us that we need to do something more, is the following. The model that uh, we use uh, is not agnostic <coughs> about quasi-isomorphism, so it really cares about quasi-isomorphism. In this language, it works. In the quasi-isomorphic language, you can't write it down, right? So, so this model does not allow for this Lee-Tru algebra model, right? So the conclusion, or our conclusion, is that the model is simply too, too rigid, and uh, we can even point to, uh, to where in the original construction where there's an assumption that it's a little bit too much. It's very natural. You get this embedding tensor you split it in anti-symmetric symmetric part. You assume the anti-symmetric part is the structure constant for the algebra. That is too, uh, too much, actually. You have to allow for some anti-symmetric part also to be part of this, this D map, right? So, so there's a choice here. That is very, very natural from a physical point of view, but that, does, that, that breaks this agnosticism. Right, so what we know now is we, we need a generalized model, and so we have to redo all the supersymmetry calculations in the end, and this is work in progress. The biggest problem is that the Young Mills model that contradicts two supersymmetries, so no matter what we do, as long as we have a Young Mills model that is free, we can never have two zero theory. In the membrane model, this was kind of solved, then we also added a gauge potential, but that was solved by just the curvature is given by the equation of motion in terms of the matter field, so it's no longer free, it's not an independent degree of freedom, and you're fine. We need a similar equation for f in our one zero model. <coughs> um, and most importantly, from a mathematical perspective, probably what we would be really interested in is the following. If you take a stack of n e brains and you split it into two substacks of n1 and n2 uh, e brains, then you have this branching of this uh, Lie group, right? Un into n1 plus un2. And a similar branching is completely unclear for stringy true algebra. So we somehow need to extend this to SUN times a vector space, but it's not completely clear how to do that. I mean, these have been classified by guys essentially, but this doesn't seem to give us enough freedom. So there's a question if we can do something more. Because we use string structures, we hope that we can extend this a little bit. And we not. If anybody has any ideas about branching of the true algebra, that would be very, very happy. And finally, there's this problem with the scalar field having the wrong sign kinetic term and the PST mechanism requiring that you have a positive scalar field. These are deep issues. Um, I think the first issue is most likely resolved if you look at the more general model. So if you read really around the supersymmetry computations using string P2 algebra. The second one I'm not sure about. I, I have to talk to any <laughs> people in particular um, uh, about, uh, about this, this uh, PST mechanism, uh, Dimitri uh, and to see uh, what this condition actually means. Okay, and then there's this whole issue of quantum and high gauge theory, but uh, these high trend science is work in progress, so hopefully we see what we can do there. Okay, so in summary, I hope I could convince you that there's a categorified analog of SU2, which is string 3, that you can write down on the except with strings that are kind of interesting. There's a classical action with many of the desired features, so the non go theorems are actually not as rigorous as you thought, but we are not there yet, right? There are a difference to the 2 0 theory, and here are the open problems. That I just discussed. Okay, I should stop now. Thank you very much. <coughs>
upgrade the SU2 to V1? Yes, I mean, so, so, so what you would start from this string stream, you should see as an analog of SU2. So you would just add a trivial set of mass degrees of freedom so that you get the analog of U2. Right. And then if you exactly see that you have one R, which is set of mass, and you have another R already in the story, so you definitely have the two abelian degrees of freedom that you want. I'm not quite sure what happens to the gauge stuff with SU2, but well, the U2 would then break into one plus U1. So you still have the gauge degrees. I mean, everything couples, so in a sense, you could argue, I don't care about the gauge things, but they're still around. So, mm -hmm. so that's certainly a question here. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think there's any charge method, right? So, to keep that, right, in those equations. Yeah. You can't fix it. That's my question, I mean. Well, I mean, what I was thinking in the story is, uh, what, what you actually mix is the, which direction? The, you give a vacuum expectation value to the phi s, I assume, right? that uh, reduces this coupling constant. And that already tells you what is just the coupling constant, you see. So that's the coupling constant in the non abelian theory. Yeah. But I, I want to break the non abelian theory to abelian. So if you say your bed for that was just giving you your Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. How did this work? Uh, that's not so clear. Yeah. I mean, there should be a degree of freedom which allows me to, I mean, which corresponds to separation of the brain. Sure, 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 sure. Of course, yeah. so we, I, I can't see it. Uh, I think <coughs> I was going to say the phi s. Did you just say the dissociation of some freedom and other? Yeah, so the, yeah, yeah, sure. But that question is maybe then not specific to your approach, but. Yeah, no, no, sure, but, but in principle you would expect that this happens as well, that, that you can see if you, if it's, I mean, my guess would be that this describes two M5 frames, and that you should be able to separate them. You should give a vacuum expectation value to um, probably a sum of phi S and phi R or something like that. Sorry, so it could even be like, I mean, I have to think a little bit about this. But it's still sort of not true, because in the M2 sure. in case, it, it was sort of not true how the heating worked out. Yeah. Mm. It wasn't as simple, which is why it might be interesting here. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's good. And then you can, uh, you also have clearly two instant solutions. Um, right. 
So you, you want to add two sets of strings, two solutions to these equations together. Yeah, that's clear. Okay, what is one? One is uh, charge one set of string. It would be charge one instant on here, probably charge minus one instant on here. Sorry, I now. And then I have. Sorry? And so now you've got not one SE2, but two SE2s. Yes, I mean, if you want to satisfy this equation, a very natural way of doing that is just doubling your pitch up, but like you know from the other so, so this is important, because when I asked, mm -hmm. do, you do you fix your gauge root? At first you said no, it could be anything. And now you told me you need two SU2s. Yes, I mean, I, I don't need them. This is just a very natural way of satisfying this condition. I can do it without that. I can fix that, actually. I can, can put them in non-trivial geometry, for example. Sorry. But I can certainly add two solutions. It's not, but I see that the, I can't, can't just add the gauge potentials and the heat still together and expect to get a new solution. So the equations are really nonlinear. Yeah, they're, they're actually the BTS equations for this other theory. And uh, you can do the uh, Bogomolny trick to get PTS parts. Okay. You can also do that. Okay, fine. Okay. Okay, I think. So yeah. <laughs> I think this is very good.